Gene's niece Nielsen is our podcast um, guest for today. He's an avid outdoorsman, a man who's actually biked in the Italian Alps, and an IT professional. He's still a W2 um, professional, uh, but that hasn't stopped him. He's a principal of Open Doors Capital and has raised almost a million dollars for apartment deals in 2019 and has invested in over 800 apartment units, 500 mobile home park lots, and 4,500 storage units, plus mortgage notes, plus private money lending, and he has 82 units of his own. I, I love this podcast. What I really liked about it was he was all about building your network, building a strong network, which is similar to Vinny and Gwaith, if you've already seen those. Uh, well, you will be seeing these podcasts. Um, whoever's in your network really dictates your your outcome. So I really like that. Um, he was all about asking the question, who do you know that you could refer me to? And I thought that was a great question to sit with. Um, as long as you're providing value to other people and figuring out where you can provide that value, um, not being selfish about it, being humble about it and saying, Hey, who do you know that we can connect with? Who do you know that we can, we can build this thing this with? I love that. And so I really hope that you enjoyed this, um, this interview as much as, as much as I do. And he's got some real, some real serious golden nuggets about who's the operator of and, and how to, and how to invest well in a multifamily syndication. Hey, Jens, thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, I wanted to kick this podcast interview off uh, with, I, I actually heard in the past that you had this great question that, that really inspired me to reach out to you um, because I knew that you would provide a lot of value to all of our listeners. It was, who do you know that I should know? And that kind of that kind of brought me and in, 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 in kind of brought me into the concept of wow, you're really thinking differently. I don't want to jump into that question. What I want to jump into is what other questions have you used in your real estate journey? You know, you're not a full time investor, but that you've used in your real estate journey to kind of get you to the next level. This is not easy. Um, yeah. Hey, Clayton, that's a, that's a good question, and I love that one, and I can't take credit for it. I, I heard it somewhere else. But I'm just, you know, I had somebody, um, I, I actually, uh, um, I found another question, actually, that I heard this weekend at a conference I was at. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and is what do I need to know about your business to refer someone to you? Ooh. So that's like, and it really, this is something that, you know, I've, I've been on quite a few podcasts and I've connected with a lot of people. And really what I like to add value is by connecting people, right? Hey, you're in Pittsburgh. So next time I meet somebody that's investing there or like looking for something, it's like, hey, you know, I know somebody there. And so I want to know more about people's businesses and what they do. So when I run into somebody, I can help that referral, referral right? And give that or carry that or pay that forward. So I really enjoy that. Right, 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 right. So, so tell us that that's, wow, that's a great question. That's a golden nugget right off the bat. So tell us a little bit about um, your, your journey into multifamily real estate. Um, first of all, obviously you're um, not from uh, America. So tell us a little bit about how you got here, um, what your profession is and why you sought real estate, particularly multifamily real estate um, to create passive income. Yeah, so you know, from my accent and my name, I was born and raised in Denmark at and um, at the tender age of twenty three. It was about what your age is now, or maybe a little bit older. <laughs> I uh, I actually moved to London, England. I got a job. I was in telecommunication back there in the nineties, and I got a job there in London, England. It was a little bit of a little bit of a surprise, a little bit of a shock moving there and kind of having to really learn, take my school English to the next level, right, and, and get involved in that. And, really learn that. Spent about a year and a half there, um, and then I was transferred to the U.S. the same company in uh, Maryland is where I landed in 1996. Um, and I had this amazing last crazy job, you know, in the late 90s, telecommunication was just going bonkers. That was like the internet was just starting, and everybody was spending all this money improving all their telecommunication networks, and we were in that business. So I literally traveled all over the world. All the Eastern, sorry, Western European countries, 
Southeast Asia, South America, all over the U.S. basically doing installations of telecommunication equipment and so forth. Super exciting, you know, that's because I've been always, I like to explore new cultures, I like to meet people, so I would always like make an effort to meet people. And it was just, it was pretty cool, it was pretty awesome. But I also had my first lesson there in, you know, in the 2000, kind of with the whole dot-com bubble burst. I had my first lesson in how unpredictable the stock market and everything else is and stuff that can happen. But I hadn't really, I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll just save some more money. And I kind of shifted into IT at that point. Mm. And I continued the, the journey. But I also saw, I actually learned between 2001 when we bought our first house to 2006, seven when we sold it. I also saw the value of how real estate can go crazy. We bought a house in Maryland for $200,000, sold it, I think it was five or six years later, for four hundred. dollars We walked away with $200,000. And we sold it like right before everything went to down the tube. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, lucky, it was just pure luck because we yeah. were moving out of Maryland. We were going, we were moving west. We were moving to New Mexico, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico in, in 2006. Um, because my wife was tired of the East Coast and she wanted to go there. I was still employed. I was still doing IT. That was my, my kind of my gig, right? And I was making good money and saving in my 401k and, you know, finished my education at the University of Maryland and all that. So I did everything you're supposed to do, right. what you're told to do, right? You know, and I'm sure, you know, a younger person like you also being told all that. And, and even your generation is much worse off because student debt and everything else is, just, you know, crushing people these days, right? Um, so, 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 so go yes, ahead. go ahead, please. No, no, you, you so, ahead. so, um, how, how, so you got, you moved to n New Mexico. So how did you go from, well, you, you know, I'm sure you, that was a gift, um, being able to sell your house right before the market <laughs> crash. Yeah, right. I'm sure there's a lot of people that, that wish that they could have timed it like you did. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you, so how did you get into your first deal and kind of what, it, what made you say, okay, you know, there, a lot of, like my, my a mentor, of mine, Tony Robbins says there has to be a breakdown before you have a breakthrough. This is a huge mm. breakthrough in terms of your mindset, how you view the world. How did you get to that point? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I, I wish in retrospect that I had seen what was going on. Um, you know, we weren't, I actually was unemployed through the whole recession, 2008, 2009, 10. And I didn't really, because I was actually working for the government at that point. I didn't actually realize how bad things were, you know, in New Mexico. Yeah, things started to go a little slow and stuff. I didn't see, you know, the the bloodletting or whatever that was happening in Phoenix and in, 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 uh, in Florida and Las Vegas, some of the places. I was like, okay, it's bad. My stock options are falling. So I didn't have the breakdown at that point, really. I think then actually later on, we, I still continued that business. We moved to, to uh, Durango, Colorado a few years later. And the breakdown was really just getting up and going to work every day and just not really seeing, hey, is this going to happen? Is this going to go for another 20 years, right? I mean, it was mm -hmm. just, I couldn't really see a way out. And I'd always thought of different you know, hey, maybe I can IT consult, maybe I can start a website, maybe I do all these things, but none of it, all it was just a new job, right? It was like, right. well, replace this job for this job, and I started to work. And I picked up a book, well, I started listening to podcasts, and I picked up some books, and I was like, oh my God, why had I not thought about this before, right? It was just really, you know, four years ago, just this sudden mindset shift. I'm, I got to create some, some multiple streams of income. I'm going to just have to do something that can really protect me and my, my family's future. Right. So that's where it kind of came from. Okay. So what, what you came from there. So the, there's a lot of people that, uh, that do that and they get there and they become, um, learners. They become, they get the shelf help. The books are on the wall. They've read every book. They can talk to all their <laughs> friends about the book. But right. how did you get into the first deal? Uh, wh walk us through briefly your mindset going into the first deal and then what it looked like in terms of financing, size of units and everything. Yeah, so I've always been, I like to study for a bit and then I take action because I learn best from taking action essentially in anything I've done, right? At, so at that point, I went to my good friend here in town who actually owns a bunch. I didn't know how many units. He actually owned at that point like 140 units or something like that. 
I knew he wasn't like, you know, hey, you're not working. Like, you don't have a day job like the rest of us. So I went to him. We had, the, we had, the, we had dinner together, and he kind of just laid it out and said, hey, this is how you look at it. He's like, he, he just wrote about the back of a napkin, essentially, income, expenses, no debt, and everything else. And said, so this is how you analyze a property. It doesn't take much. You can just look at it. It's like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And then I asked that question that you started the conversation with, who do you know that I should know? And he referred me to, um, to a broker that he had worked with for many years back in actually in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He used to live down there. He referred me to this gentleman and, you know, I call him up and get in touch with him. And I say, hey, I want to buy a fourplex. You know, I felt like that was safe. We had some money saved up. And at that time, you know, three or four years ago, you can get a fourplex for 120, 150 grand, right? Um, so we found some, we found a fourplex. Um, it was like really cheap, 115, $117,000. Um, bought that, just got, you know, 25% down con conventional financing. And it needed some work, you know, the flat roofs down there, so they, they, they always tend to leak. So we put a new roof on, some new stucco, fixed up a couple of units, and just start renting it out. And I was like, huh, we're cash flowing $1,000 a month in this fourplex, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that's amazing. Let's do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so then we bought that, and then shortly a few months after, we bought another fourplex. And again, we had, you know, this is on our own account. We had capital that we had saved up that was sitting in the stock market. And uh, I know my broker was not very happy today. I sold, told him, said, hey, I'm kind of firing you. Sell all the stocks I have and transfer it into an account I can control myself, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that was interesting. Yeah, so bought the fourplex. And then shortly thereafter, maybe six months later, we bought uh, 11 units. So within a six, seven months period, we actually had 19 doors, all in our own account. I mean, you know, so what was the investment? $100,000 on our, on our part, right? Um, and uh, so that was kind of the start, you know, investing in our own account. But I also realized, hey, syndications and going bigger is really where the money is. But I felt like, you know, I wasn't really, I, I didn't quite have that mindset around that yet. So I said, well, let me invest passively. So I opened a, you know, self-directed IRA, moved some IRA money into that and bought into some syndications and also some node funds and other things. Cause I really wanted to get my, my money away from main, from wall street and into main street instead. Right. Um, so that was kind of the two prong, prong approach I took back then. So, so when you, when, what, made you feel comfortable um there are so many people now that are operators that are gps that have podcasts that have this and that information um the market's really hot now what would you say to someone who might be a passive investor listening um that helped you feel comfortable in investing in what is there any criteria that you use you're a very analytical person i know that <laughs> Um, yeah, I, look, I really look at three things when I look at a, at, a, at a deal I need to invest in, that I want to invest in passively. Number one, who's the operator? Does that operator have some sort of experience and track record or has he or she aligned himself with a team that has some experience, right? If there was three green guys that came and said, hey, I want to sell this building, I'd be like, ooh, maybe not, right? Um, so I found an operator that had done some deals. They were in a very strong, so that was the first one, the operator, that the operator, right? And I felt like this person had done some good deals and they had, um, some track record, not years and years, but at least long enough to make me feel comfortable. Then number two then is, is the, uh, is the, is the property itself. You know, and I know enough about underwriting, so I could really look at the underwriting and see, Hey, does this make sense? You know, they shared the T12 and the rent roll and their projections and their loans and, you know, all that stuff. So I looked over that and I felt, yeah, that looks reasonable. And then the third is the market, you know, either, either kind of a growth market or a strong cash flow market. And this is Dallas Fort Worth, which has been growing kind of crazy, you know, for many years. So it's kind of a, it's growing pretty strongly, but it also is a high demand for rentals. So I felt like that. I felt like those three things lined up with this property and, you know, and again, I'm not, I'm not, a, I, I tend to 
analyze so bid may not take action because otherwise you get stuck in analysis, uh, analysis paralysis, right? Right, right. Okay, so you you got into um, your first deal, then you started investing into um, other syndicators, and then you said, "Oh my goodness, this this is kind of a cool business plan," and you <laughs> <Right>. started syndicating <laughs> um, your own deals. Um, so, can you walk us through a little bit about how you started to build relationships? Why you thought that that was viable for raising money? Yeah, so I actually did. Didn't quite go straight into syndication. We did a JV on a 38 unit in Albuquerque. Got some friends, you know, okay. five of us partnered on this deal, you know, and, and uh, a pretty hairy deal in terms of the amount of work that it required. But we got an amazing like $1.2 million for 38 units, right? So, um, so that was kind of like, hey, now I feel comfortable bringing other people's money in because I know enough about the market. I was aligned with some people who are going to rehab it. So I, I felt I felt comfortable enough to actually take that um, take that step, um, and then I also realized, okay, this is great. Now I'm out of money, right? What am I going to do next? And in the meanwhile, I had I had started kind of an education. I started a, a mentorship program and uh, gotten myself, you know, educated more about syndication and everything else. And I had aligned myself with some people, made friends essentially that were doing these things, right? They were raising money, they were finding deals, they were syndicating. Um, so I started, you know, hey, you know, if there's an opportunity for me to become part of a GP and something, let me know, because I really want to, you know, explore this. Um, I didn't, at that time, it was, I didn't feel I could go in, go out there and be the, the, the lead, the key, key, key principal on something, or uh, just because of my, my work and stuff. So I felt like if I aligned myself with somebody that's doing this, it would help. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess going back to your, your question around how do I how did I create those relationships to to raise the capital and that was the conversation that started really years before I I needed the money you know I would say hey here is um, here's a deal I've invested in here's the numbers what I've you know, we have done you know here's an example of what a deal a bigger deal may look like if if I ever find something like this are you interested you know. Kind of a sample deal package and just kind of start talking to people i would create a mailing list i would start putting people on the list i would send out say oh here's the properties you're working on so a little bit of promotion a little bit of uh, marketing in that regard so it wasn't just today i needed money i started asking people because then it's too late right so mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the, the progress there are, are, are most of the people that you have raised money for friends and family or have you started to raise money out of kind of auxiliary relationships and the reason why i ask this is um you've said uh know me uh like me trust me buy me and refer me is that the way you look at your relationships walk us through that because I, I think that's a great way to look at it i think that's a good way to look at it because it is it is a relationship and you're you can't you can't get a referral referral at the end of the relationship if you're not if you're not viewing it as a step-by-step -step process. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening to my other podcast, <laughs> bringing that out. Um, yes, it is, you know, we're doing 506 Bs. You have to have a relationship with, with the, with the investor and stuff or be referred them and so forth. So yes, it was friends and family, you know, people in the community. I, I, I know, you know, and, uh, and it doesn't take a lot of investors to raise money. Right. Um, essentially, you know, I think I have 17 or 18 investors that have brought most of the capital to me, right? Because people invest in multiple deals. So you don't need hundreds of people to do it. You just need a core group of people that trust mm. you and, and are willing to, you know, work with you. But it is a relationship-based business because remember, these properties we're investing in are, you're only one person. It's, you know, me, I know this property and I know everybody that's involved. So it is like Main Street investing, right? It is right, right there. So you know what's going on. You can go to the property. You can call up the property manager. So it's really a lot about that that trust in the person that's running it, the trust in that the property is the right trust, the right property. Right. Um, you know. So you know. Then I've gone to events and I've met more people. I've grown my network as well that way. Right. And, and I've had you know from podcasts about people call me up and we've started a relationship that way. And I've gotten an investment too from from that. Right. But it's just a 
it's just a long term kind of thing, right? Because these people are going to be with you a long time. And you right. Don't wanna, you don't want to misuse that trust, right? Yeah, yeah. So you currently, um, you've been syndicating. Uh, you have over eighty two units. Um, how are you getting deals in this market? I've heard you use direct mail in the past for smaller unit buildings. What are you using now um, to get deals? Yeah, so for my, you know, investing in my own account, yeah, direct mail and so forth has has helped a lot. Uh, but again, we're, you know, running out of money, <laughs> own money, right? Every time we buy something, it's, we got to rebuild that, that capital. So on the, on the, on the um, on the larger properties, really, what I've done is is align myself with with people that are really strong in the market that have created those relationships. I go in and I bring some value to that. You know, do you guys need um, uh, due diligence help? Do you need uh, underwriting? Do you need um, uh, you know management? Um, uh, what do you call it? asset management? you know, uh, investor related. So basically try to align myself and find out, you know, what does this team need? What can I bring to it? Right. I must be honest, to be honest, I actually have not spent a lot of time recently going out and finding my own deals. Um, it is something that I'm trying to build up and trying to create a partnership with somebody that's going to be spending a lot more time on that. Um, right. That's, but I've just been able to align myself with people who has had that deal flow and I've been able to add value in other ways, right? I think that's great because I think that um, there's a pressure always to be the jack of all trades, right? You're going to do it. You're going to syndicate it. You're going to raise the money and you are making it happen. You are making it happen as a W2 employee. You're, and you're saying maybe I can't call brokers during the day because that's when they operate nine to five and you know how brokers are. They're not calling you back after <laughs> five o'clock <laughs> and they're not calling you on the weekends. Um, which is, which is okay. That's how that world operates. But you are, I hope this is an incredible lesson to our listeners. And this is a total golden nugget. You're making it happen. You're bringing whatever value you can. You're reaching out to people who are, who are experienced and you're saying, listen, I'm, I, I can underwrite for you. I can bring the capital. I can do this. I want to get involved. And if you show that initiative to people and you say, I want to be a part of this, they're going to bring you in. They're going to bring yeah. you in. That's awesome. So, you just so, have to look at what value you can bring, right? That's anything in life. You bring, if you go and get a job, you have to bring certain value to your employer. If you try to syndicate a deal, bring value to your team, right? It, it's anything we do in life. And, and if you can bring more value, how do you get, how does people get highly compensated for whatever they do? It's because they bring more value. They bring so much value to whatever it is, right? Right. Uh, and that's really what we have to think about. It's like, oh, I deserve a raise. If we're W two, well, bring more value, and then we can look at if if that's going to happen. You know, yeah, you, you know, if you can make if you can buy a property and make a hundred investors a lot of money, well, then you're adding a lot of value to that 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 those people, and then you can use that to leverage into the next deal. Right? So always think about who can you help and how can you help versus yeah. how can I get something out of it. Right. Right. Right, right. Who do you know that I should know? <laughs> awesome. Hey, this is, let's jump into the lightning round. Um, sure. Appreciate your time today, but we're running out of time. Um, this is the Real Talk Real Estate Investing Podcast lightning round. Um, what is your favorite real estate book? You know, I almost go to, um, I've read a lot of real estate books mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're going to keep on that, I think uh, the, the Million Dollar Real Estate Investor by uh, Gary Keller, I think that's a really good book and it really opens your eyes to how can you make a million dollars a year doing real estate investing. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, it, sound, it sounded like you had another one on your mind, maybe outside of real estate. Yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time not reading real estate books because I, I'm a lot, I'm very interested in personal development and everything else. Right. The one that I keep going back to is called the slight Edge by, um, Olson. Uh, I don't know, Mike, but uh, last name is Olson. And so this idea of, uh, doing, is it Jeff? Um, is it Jeff Olson? Jeff Olson. I think you're right. Jessel. Okay. Okay. Basically that idea of, this is not going to see my hands. You do small things every day to work towards your goals, right? We don't, we look at people that are very successful, like, oh my God, how did I get there? And I can never get there. And then you give up. 
Right. No, if you just realize it's small incremental steps every day towards your goal, and eventually you create that trajectory and that, 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 that positive movement towards your goals. And I think that's what everybody needs to realize. There's no magic fix. There's no get rid scheme. There's no, no, nobody's handed that. Well, most people are not handed a gold <laughs> spoon or whatever you call it. So we just yeah, have to be yeah. willing to take, make the work. And, you know, you're an example. You're young and you're enthusiastic and you're doing all this stuff. So that's really awesome to see. So. Sorry, that was yeah. a long-winded answer here. No, no, I think that I think that's no, I think that's great. I think that um, even I really personally, um, to be a little vulnerable, I struggle with it. Um, you know, I, um, I see that that I want to get I want to get that 150 unit under contract. You know what I mean? Like, but th- there's not that many deals, and uh, if you're syndicating, you're raising, you know, you're raising money. You're the steward of someone else's wealth. And you, you have to represent yourself that way and you have to represent um, your uh, acquisition analysis that way. And so it's, it's easy to jump in and get it. There's a lot of properties on LoopNet. There are a lot of properties on LoopNet. And if you want to get into that, you can do it. But if you do play that slight edge, you reach out to the brokers, you build those relationships, you add value to people and your investors. I, I agree. That's a great book. Um, I haven't read that actually. Um, so I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, I'm going to check it out. That's going into the Amazon. Um, so what's been your biggest mistake in real estate and, and how has that helped you um, kind of moving forward? Um, I think you need to be careful about the areas you buy properties in just because they're cheap doesn't mean they're going to cash flow. You know, some of the earlier properties we bought in re- in retrospect, it's like, yeah, they they should cash flow on, on on paper, but then the tenant class is a little bit more challenging. So I would think just buying in the wrong area is probably the biggest the biggest challenge, the biggest mistake. That's a that's a great um that's a great tip. There's a there's a great red website for our listeners, uh, city city dot data um or city hyphen data dot com. You can check out sub markets um to really get down on you know crime rates and um, percentage of renters in the sub markets. Um, if there's a Starbucks mocha latte, that's pretty good too. Um, <laughs> so what's your what's your real talk best mindset tip? Just never, ever, ever give up. Give up, right? Just keep going. And if you, if, you know, if you hit a challenge, or you gotta find a way to like through it over it around it, whatever. And uh, I mean, just kind of a little. And I, I didn't tell you anything about it, but I've been in the bike racer for twenty years, and I've done hundred mile races and 12, 24 hour races and stuff like that. And I've been out there where everything just I felt like crap, and it was just oh, this is the, what am why am I doing this, right? But I was like, okay, just hang in there. Things are going to get better and you're going to finish this thing, right? So just mm-hmm. really push through that stuff and never, mm-hmm. never give up because that's, I think that's, that's one of the biggest just, uh, differentiators between successful and not so successful people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a phenomenal tip. Um, a lot of people take that for granted. And there's kind of a, there's kind of a switch in your mind when you say I'm going to embody the person that will not give up, um, that's going to keep going. And I imagine doing a hundred mile uh, bike race. I ran cross country. Um, and that's nothing compared to that. So I, I can, I can, I can feel that, that little voice in the head. Um, so before I ask you our last questions, how can our listeners get in touch with you? You provide so much value to, to us today. I appreciate that. So my uh, my email is Jens J E N S at opendoorscapital dot com. So that's doors with an S. And I like to get on phone calls with people. You and I did that. So you can go to opendoorscapital dot com slash call, and you can schedule a free twenty minute call with me. I love to talk to anybody. You know, it's we just get set up a call, we talk, and you know, real estate or anything else. You know, how I can help you. You know, maybe there's something. Right. Some some way we can we can add value to each other, right? Absolutely. Okay. So, what is your real talk best tip that you can give our listeners that has had the biggest impact on your investing career? Just be cognizant about your network who is in your network, the people you choose to spend time with, right? 
because we quite often are not we're like, oh, you know, I grew up with Johnny and we went to school together, we went to, you know, mm-hmm. the clubs and, and you keep hanging out with Johnny, but Johnny is not doing anything. He's, you know, drinking beer all the Saturday, Sunday. But you, he's your friend. If you kind of realize that you become the average of the five people you hang out with the most, and I don't remember who said that had that quote either, think about that and said, okay, if you want to be a successful real estate investor, you want to have a thousand units, go and find the people who has a thousand units, find a way to add value to them, become part of a network. What I did, I started a, I started a, 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 a mastermind on Zoom, and I invited some people that I knew were ahead of me in the game. And I said, hey, I'll, I'll set this thing up once a, once a month. I'll pay for the Zoom thing. Just get together and let's, let's wow. just share stuff. And I said, I'll bring this guy and that guy in. So they felt like they could get to, to, to meet people that they wanted to work with, and I was kind of the conduit for that, right? So, so just – be cognizant about who you hang out with, build your network, and be um, just seek out those people that uh, that can add that push yeah. you to the next next level. Get on the phone with this guy. He's inspiring me to go out. I gotta <laughs> I gotta get on the phone and uh, talk to, talk some brokers, but I know they're not picking up. Again, that's <laughs> opendoorscapital.com/call. Um, I hope that you got as much value that I got from this, from this, um, the slight edge up that's going in there. And I love, again, one last thing that open doors, capital multifamily real estate uh, is, is a way for you to open your doors and open the doors for the people you care about the, your friends, your family, um, through value add multifamily real estate investing. Thank you so much for joining us today. And again, guys, Get that, schedule that phone call. I'm sure he'll provide a lot of value for you. Thanks, Clayton. I appreciate your time. It was awesome hanging out.